one. Boom. And we are joined by Dean Thomas, um, a friend of mine, but also, of course, an MMA guru um, from a fighter to a coach to an analyst. You literally just do it all. It's always a pleasure. So thank you for coming on. Oh, but the most important thing you said is I was your friend. So you are thank you. I, I yeah. do consider you as a friend. I really do. Because every conversation I have with you, it's like you're just a very sincere person. And I just I've come across a lot of people who aren't like that. So you've always helped me out. You've given me the time and opportunity to uh, pick your brain. And I'm just very thankful for that. So I appreciate it. Stay blessed. Stay blessed. That's okay, Max. Little Max Holloway over there, the blessed era. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I just want to, again, so say thank you. But first of all, this is a really strange time. Um, last time I spoke to you, the pandemic was just going down. Um, then we had the protests, obviously, the social injustice. It's just been, 2020 has been just a hell of a ride. So first of all, how are you, uh, your family, all as well? Man, you know, I ride with everything, man. Like, you know, I know life is crazy. I mean, obviously, this is the craziest year that I've ever lived out. But life is crazy, and I ride with everything. So I'm just I'm just happy to still be alive. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, right. yeah. I, and to have, honestly, I, I still feel like I'm blessed because the industry that I'm in is still thriving. And right. there's a lot of people out there I know that are, suffering and you know on you know trying to collect unemployment and they can't and they're right. suffering and i'm just blessed that i'm in an industry that's not supposed to really be here but it's mm -hmm. here and thriving through a pandemic so right. i can't complain i'm just i'm happy to be here that's a very that's a w very well put like the way you said that because it is like the ufc's thriving it's like one of the very few things right now that just not only didn't skip a beat, but if anything is thriving, it's excelling because of everything that's going on. Um, but you brought up something and I, before we dive into MMA, just kind of a life question for you. I'm a young man. I'm 22 years old, finishing up school, entering the broadcast business. I've been in it for a while now because I've done it while I'm in school. Um, I remember calling up a couple mentors of mine, Rob Parker, who's on FS1, Rashad Phillips. And I'm like, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. And I'm like, I'm not sure how to approach this because I don't want to in any way disrespect or not focus on what's going on in the real world. Um, but you just said it. This is the craziest year you've ever seen as well. So this is just unmatched times, unprecedented times all across the board, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we let's think about it. Let's, let's, let's put this. I mean, there's, there's, there were murder hornets that we forgot about. Like, you know what I'm saying? There were hornets that were going around <laughs> killing people that we forgot about. A squirrel right now has the bubonic plague. <laughs> wait, wait, you know what, what? A squirrel in Colorado was tested positive for the bubonic plague. This is breaking like, news for me. Yeah, like who, how would they even know to test a squirrel for that? It sounds so like, like the, I'm sorry? It sounds like the Simpsons, if you've ever seen the Simpsons movie, and that like that squirrel has like five different eyes and they test it. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just crazy, man. So, I mean, so there's a lot of crazy things that's been happening for me, like, <laughs> like a couple of weeks ago, just like the fact that like black people were in. <laughs> I'm like, what is what is going on with this with the world right now? So I don't know. I'm just again, I'm just I ride with everything, man. I, I right. try not to be, you know, uh, frictitious to anything, man. I just ride and ride and just enjoy life. So here right. I am. And it's crazy. I mean, we had Kobe Bryant's passing. People forget about the forest fires. We had World War Three as a possibility. Like, so that's not even mentioning everything we just talked about. So, yeah, it's been definitely a hell of a ride. But um, I want to get right into it. So when I talked to you, the first thing I was like, Dean, I think this is an amazing opportunity for the UFC. All the sports are on pause, on hold. They don't even know when they're coming back, if they're coming back. Just recently, we know the NBA is returning um, here in Orlando. The UFC pulled it off. And but did you foresee or think that Fight Island would actually happen? Because we thought that the UFC would happen and they put on shows, but Fight Island sounds like it's out of Mortal Kombat. Did you think that Dana White was going to be able to pull that off? Yeah, I knew. I know Dana is a savage man, and he right. doesn't care. He's a savage, and he's going to do what he's set out to do, regardless. Like I right. think he would have pulled this off. I think he. I think he would have put it in his backyard if he had <laughs> to. You know what I'm saying? I think. Dana's a savage. Right. Um, I didn't know that they would pull it off at this extent. I was hoping it would be kind of different. I was hoping it would be on like some like remote island, like really right. like, you know, <laughs> some remote island with just like trees around and, you know, yeah. and fighters getting bit by mosquitoes and stuff like that. But I, but like 
if if you see the extent of what they went through to make this happen, it's yeah. mind blowing, mind blowing. The amount of money, time, effort, the people working behind the scenes. I mean, I'm in Vegas right now, still quarantined from coming out here to go to Fight Island, and wow. yeah, because I got tested and came back positive. That I, I couldn't even go, but the fact that everybody has to go through this process in all the countries that they came from. Right. It's, it's it's amazing. It is amazing what they went through to make this ha- Fight Island thing happen. I'm about to say, I mean, the attention to detail. Like you said, every individual you have to test, um, every individual may have to quarantine, uh, the coaches, the families. That must be so many different things to consider and talk about. Like, how do you, to get the manager's approval, to get the family's approval, the fighters have families. That just, it's a insane thing that he pulled off. And I, he always says in these interviews, because I know these these media guys just kind of go at him, and he's like, this is the biggest thing I've ever pulled off. So it's just been incredible to see that that really happen and come to fruition. And like you said, I really don't know if anyone else could have done it, because Dana White has that mentality to just go for it. He's got that fighter mentality. So the thing is, like, what he appreciates in most fighters in terms of stepping up to take crazy fights, um, you know, just working with people, not asking for, you know, like... You know how he doesn't like guys trying to butcher, you know, trying to, you know, stick them up for a lot of money. Right. And he just likes guys to go out there and fight. And that's the way, honestly, that's the way he kind of lives his life. Like he appreciates right. that from people like that are easy to work with and just like to get things done. I mean, t- in order to make this happen, he had to do a lot. I mean, he got a, he's got to have an amazing team around him and he's right. got an amazing team. But it's his vision and it's his, and it's his reputation and everything on the line. And the fact that he was able to step up and put this together is is mind blowing. Is I don't know if anybody else could have did it. Wow. Now I find this so interesting. Obviously, broadcasting is what I'm pursuing and what I do. Um, but I am just so fascinated with the business side of sports, with like general managers and trading and agents and signings. I would love to just pick his brain because how he's been able to do this has just been incredible. But I just want to say I told you so on something. So I want to dive into UFC 251. Oh. And- I want to say I told you there needs to be a scoreboard in MMA, and it it just keeps on popping up every single time this happens. Max Holloway, I believe, won that fight, and that's no disrespect to Alex. I he, he fought a good fight. I personally, and mo- I can think most people consider Max Holloway won that fight, and I think he thought he won that fight. So if you had a scoreboard, we would have known this. The fighters would have known it, the fans, uh, the coaches, and it would have held the judges accountable. Did you? Uh, watching that fight, think that Max won, or do you disagree with me there? Um, no, I so and I said this on on another podcast that I thought Max won as I was watching the fight. I wasn't scoring the fight, but just watching it, right, right. You know, eating pizza and you know just mm-hmm. watching. You know, I was I thought Max won the fight. I wasn't fully paying attention, but just looking up, turn. Yeah, I thought he won the fight. Mm-hmm. But then I also said this is that. We have to all like in that in terms of that fight in particular, we have to be careful that we score the fight properly and we score it round for round for what uh, what each round is. Because at the end of the day, a fight is really just merely an entitled fight, five mini fights that you score who won this round, and then you calculate it from that. But and I'm not saying Max didn't win, I'm just saying Mm -hmm. that. I have to go back and watch it and rescore the rounds to make sure that I'm making the proper judgment because, you know, right. who knows? Maybe, maybe Alex did edge out three rounds barely, and then right. the other two that he lost, he could have lost them big, but the three rounds that he did win could have been like so, so at a, such a small margin that we yeah. forget about that. So, but now I'm talking about that fight in particular, but that has nothing to do with the fact that I still believe there needs to be a scoreboard, like you said. Yeah, I, I've always been a, a an advocate of that. There needs to be a scoreboard. There, the fighters need to know where they're at. The coaches need to know where they're at because you can make adjustments and and, and plan for it. And the argument that fighters are going to coast is such a weak argument. That that's is such I mean. a weak that argument. Is, that's what I'm saying. I need you to call Dana White when he's like sound asleep and just wake him up with this type of news. And I think you, Dana White's such an innovative guy. He's such a, and I don't know if this is just fully in his hands to do this because I'm sure there's things he has to run by and legislation and whatnot, but I just think he's such a head of the curve, adapt, and like you said, just kind of a go-getter. I think he, 
I, I just remember watching some of his interviews, his responses when fighters get robbed and he absolutely hates it. So I just think he would appreciate that because you would see less of it. Or if you did see it, you know, the judges are accountable. Like, okay, wait a second. They just gave that round to Alex. Like I just had Max winning that round. What did they see? So then it's like, okay, now we get to see the process of them getting robbed at least. So it's like, okay, Max knows these judges don't know what they're doing. Yeah. But, you know, I think that Dana could, Dana could do that if he truly wants to. And I think it's going to take a few more bad decisions for him to be like, you know what? We're losing money because of this. Because they can, yeah. because right now it doesn't really matter for them. Because, right. you know, the fighters are getting paid either way. And for them, it's just about entertainment, so to say. But the way the contracts are structured in terms of most fighters get double pay for winning, mm -hmm. when fighters start really complaining about man, I'm losing half my money because these judges are bad, then that's going to really impact the game. And then it's going to have to change. But in terms of the change, the credit that I'm going to have to give that to is Shannon Nat from Invicta because they're already doing it. Right. They're already using an open scoring. And they barely have the resources to do something like that. The UFC could easily do it. But again, it's not really impacting them from a financial standpoint that much right now. When it starts to impact them, then they're gonna be like, "Uh oh, we need to we need to make some changes right. because yeah. this is just is isn't fair. The fighters are getting robbed. Um, we're starting to feel the effects of this, so we're gonna have to change this." But I think that's one of the most important things in MMA right now that needs to be changed. Yeah, I um, and I think because this really affects Max Holloway. So now he's fought the same guy twice and lost, and we know how tough it is to get that third fight. And it's like, okay, you're gonna now you're gonna have to win a couple fights and get that back up. So this put. Max in a predicament where, of course, we still respect him. He's still an amazing fighter, but going down 0-2 to someone instead of 1-1 one and one, and then the rubber match is definitely a harder obstacle to overcome. Um, but another thing I spoke to Phil DeRue about from, obviously, American Top Team, and he brought up an amazing point that I never thought of was, what, uh, like, what if they set a schedule? Like the MMA, because I asked him, I'm like, what's one rule you could change about this sport if you could do it? And... He's like, I think there needs to be a schedule, especially from me as a trainer's perspective. Like football, they have a football camp. This is when the season starts. This is when it ends. I, obviously, the NBA, we're going to have the preseason. You have the draft. You have workouts, summer league. Uh, the season starts. Do you think that's something um, that could come to fruition or is possible? And I know it's harder because you're dealing with individuals. Um, you're dealing with negotiations. Not everyone makes the same. Uh, but do you think that's something that could benefit not only the fighters because they would have a set date, but the coaches and obviously the fans because you know when to expect a good fight? Well, yeah, I think so because what I mean, essentially, that's what the PFL has attempted yeah. to do to the best of their ability. And I do think that that can work. I do think that it really could work because then, you know, the league, it'll put the league in control, you know, right. because now the fighters are in control. I don't want to fight then. I want to fight now. Well, this is the date. You know what I'm saying? You can't. You don't have a choice. It's either you fight now or you wait six months. I'm telling you that now. Because right now, fighters are like, no, I don't want to fight in August. I want to fight in September. Right. I don't want to fight in September. I want to fight in October. But if the, the date for the plan for the fights are uh, October, you're mm -hmm. fighting in October. So either you make the cut or you don't, or you wait another six months until it comes back around. So I do think that it can work. I do think that it is a good idea. And I think that it also could solve, like, solve the prop. Like in the PFL, they have all, the lightweight tournament. Mm -hmm. When some, If a lightweight gets hurt, there's another one ready to step up. You know, right. so they know that this is the date. I need all the lightweights are going to be on that card. So this is the date. So if I something were to happen, one of them could always step up. I think it solves that problem, you know, because now it's like, Oh man, we got to find somebody on short notice, blah, 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 blah. But if you had a schedule, it'd be a lot easier to uh, right. really rectify that problem. Right. No, I 100% agree. Now, I want to dive into the main event, Masvidal Usman. Um, Masvidal took this on what, six days' notice. He had a cut weight uh, and he won the first round, arguably. And then, of course, he survived, went to the distance. I don't think people understand how hard that is to do on six days' notice. But Usman's getting a lot of criticism um, for not finishing him or having a boring style. What do you what do you make of that? Because I feel like whenever we see a champion and his way of fighting works, we expect them to change it up for the entertainment of the fans. Like Floyd Mayweather always got a lot of criticism because he's not the most entertaining, but he always won. 
Uh, George St. Pierre got a lot of criticism, but the way he fought, he knew was smart for and beneficial towards him and winning and not taking a lot of damage. Um, we're starting to see it a little bit with Habib, but because Habib is so aggressive when he's on the ground, he's not getting as much of it. But do you think the criticism is fair of Kamaru Usman? No, not at all. You know, we, we can't put the burden on the winner to change his to change what he's doing to win in order to entertain us and put him at more risk at losing. We can't right. ask him to do that. That's that's a ridiculous thing to do to ask the guy who's winning to change <laughs> what he's doing and risk losing so that I can be entertained and be like, oh, you you put on a good fight. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter for him. He's doing the right thing. He's doing what he needs to do. And we also got to say this is that when you get to that level where it is really competitive and you're dealing with the number one guy every time that it's been training specifically for you. It's going to be hard to put guys away. Now, say what you will about Usman and Masvidal. Usman took or Masvidal took it on six days' notice. Masvidal's been training for Usman. Let's not get that twisted. He's right. been training this entire time. And Masvidal's not a young fighter. Masvidal's a veteran who knows how to fight. One of the best fighters I've seen who knows how to fight, knows how to make adjustments and adapt in the middle of a fight. So right. I don't think the fight would have been, that first fight would have been any different had... Masvidal had more time. I don't think it would have been much different because I think that what Masvidal thought of Usman wouldn't have changed. I thought he, I think he would have went out there and fought the same fight and still got pinned up against defense like that. Right. With that said, I think now that Masvidal knows that there is a possibility that Usman can do that because he's already done it, right. Masvidal will prepare for that. And I think in a rematch, Masvidal could possibly win. Okay, so off that, let me just ask you this from a fighter and coach's perspective. Can you really change your style or improve upon your skills when you're already a veteran? Because I feel like you're already molded. You are who you are. Like, for example, um, when Connor fights Habib, if that ever happens again, does he have enough time to really say, okay, I'm going to focus on the wrestling? We all knew Habib wanted to take him down. Is it realistic to be able to say he's not going to take me down and really approve upon that part of your game where you can match his level? Like Masvidal knows Usman's going to apply pressure. He's going to try to take me down. And he knows that's the focus. Is it realistic that you're able to say, OK, this is what I'm going to do and actually stop it? Well, it depends on the type of fighter you are. I think that Masvidal has the skills, the ability and the experience to make to train specific things in terms of what he needs to do in order to not allow that to happen, to make those adjustments in the fight. I think that he's good enough to do that. Okay. But I don't think Usman could change what he's doing in order to beat a guy like Masvidal. Because Usman, I think, is... I don't want to say he's peaked in what he can do, but he, he just doesn't... I don't think he has the physical ability or the speed or the coordination to make adjustments like the, I think right. Masvidal does. So right. I think he's just limited by certain physicalities. But Masvidal could. So I, that's why I think in a rematch, I think if, if there was a rematch, I would favor Masvidal in the rematch. Okay, so let's just act like you are the new matchmaker. Um, do you make that fight right away? Do you have Masvidal fight Connor for the BMF belt? It's a money fight. Do you have Masvidal fight just a contender and get a win under his belt? What do you think is the best move for Masvidal next then? Well, I think the, next, the best move for Masvidal next is to sit for a little bit. Okay. Sit for a little bit. Um, let these other guys kind of weed themselves out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, have um, Gilbert Burns fight. Uh, fight. And then let's see what uh, Leon Edwards is doing. And maybe have him fight. Right. And then I also, then I think, you know, because Masvidal is the draw right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't want to, we don't want to waste him. He's the draw. I say let Gilbert Burns fight Usman, then have Masvidal fight the winner of that. Okay. Because Masvidal yeah. is the draw. Let's not forget that. Masvidal is the draw. We got to give him credit for that. He is. He is. The yeah, he's the biggest star right now in MMA, so let him fight the winner. All right, so off that note, I'm going to apply a little more pressure to you here. Let's say you can create three fights. Um, again, you and Dana White are sitting in a room. He's like, Dean, I love you. I want you to make three fights that everyone wants to see. What are those three fights you would make? Oh, wow. Um, hmm. <sighs> Let's see. I would make Khabib and Tony. Okay. And if the, let's just act no, like No, not Tony, not Tony, not Tony. <laughs> Khabib and um, uh, Gaethje. Okay. 
to be even Gaethje. Um, believe it or not, this is the one only, this is the only other one fight that I will say is for Masvidal. I, I almost forgot about this one, but I would make this one. Uh, Masvidal and uh, Kobe. Okay. All right. Make yeah. Masvidal and Kobe. And then I would make John Jones and Francis. Oh, I, now I definitely think we're going to see uh, Gaethje and Habib. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what's going to happen with the Bones situation, but I really want to see John Jones versus Francis Naganu. I think it's the most challenging fight in John Jones' career. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, Ngannou presents a tremendous amount of problems for anybody he's going to face. And he's going to present problems to John that John's never seen before. And uh, but and we'll see how good John really is by facing that challenge. So I, I think that's the fight to make. And I think you, by the way, a plus. So I think you're that's your new position. I do you see Kobe Covington now. Kobe Covington and Jorge Masvidal is a very realistic fight that can happen. They obviously don't like each other. Do you think Masvidal now has the advantage because he fought? You could say the better Kobe Covington. He fought Usman, who kind of has the similar style to Kobe, but he beat Kobe. So do you think now that he has even a slight advantage now going into that fight because he's already experienced that type of pressure, that type of wrestling, um, do you see Masvidal kind of having that slight edge over Kobe now? No, I think it's a completely different fight, honestly. Between Really? Kobe, yeah, Kobe and, Mas- or Kobe and, and uh, Usman are completely different. I know they look the same. They have the same like end game of what they want, their approach in terms right. of, um, you know, pinning guys against defense and being really sticky, but they're completely different. You know, for one, you know, Usman switches stances. He's, yeah. He's a bit, he's long and he's a little bit more calculated than Colby. Colby's, Colby's, you know, uh, pretty quick on his feet, honestly. Yeah. Moves around a lot. Um, yeah. It's a completely a different approach. And it, I think the, what, what Masvidal faced in Usman doesn't prepare him for Kobe. Okay. It doesn't prepare him for Kobe. So um, I don't think that gives him an advantage. But I do think that Masvidal is the better fighter between the two. But, again, you got to show up on fight day and prove it. You know, it's, it's a matter of can Kobe, you know, establish himself early and and put things together early and try to wear Masvidal out. I don't know. I don't know if he can, though. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. So the last thing I have for you, well, a couple, the two last things is you are um, like the inside scoop. You know Dana White personally. You're on a show with him looking for a fight. Uh, again, you also are in the trenches with the fighters, coaching them up. You also get the fighter respect because you are a fighter. Um, what is going on right now? It's like we see a dispute between some of the stars and Dana White and the UFC. Um, and so I have to ask. Why now? Like, why now are the fighters saying, hey, we're not getting enough money? Um, and what? how is Dana White's response? Can you kind of just be the bridge between the people that want to know what's really going on and what's, like, going on with the UFC and the fighters themselves? Well, you got to think of it like this. Like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Okay. With all sports being closed down, it's important, and, and for, it's important for the UFC to be the one sport that keeps it going. So what do they need to keep it going? What is the product? The fighters. Right. So the fighters have recognized that the UFC needs them right now. Mm -hmm. So now if there's any time in history where the fighters will have leverage is now because they need they need them. The fight the UFC needs them. I mean, they're having cards every other weekend. Yeah. Not even. Like they have four cards in two weeks. (laughs) So so they know that it's important for the UFC to need them. So now it's like, you want me? You got to pay me. And I get it. You know, they they want to be compensated. But um, but I, I think it's, you know, again, like it's it's kind of unfair. And I don't want to say, you know, it's kind of it is a bit unfair because it's like, dude, you're going to stick me up now. <laughs> but <laughs> but I don't know, like it, it just I think it opens up Pandora's box that there is a disconnect between the company and the product. And there right. needs to be better, more unity between the two because, and there's a lot of disconnect between the product in itself because there's, you know, some fighters like, nah, screw the man. And then there's other ones like, dude, I'm just happy to be here. You know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to cut grass. You right. Know? So you're making it hard for me because, you know, if I'm not, if I don't have this job fighting, doing what I love, I got to get a real job. So please, let's not make this hard. And, right. 
So I think there's a, there just needs to be a little bit more unity between everybody. Everybody needs to just start trying to work together a little bit better. And that's what I was saying about Dana in the beginning, is that Dana likes, to be honest with you, like he likes guys that just like to work, that are easy to work with. Like, hey, listen, let's get this done. How What can we do to get this done? Boom, that's it. Let's go. And sometimes the fighters could be a little bit, no, I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. And mm -hmm. they're a little bit hard to work with. So that's where we have these problems. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, you shouldn't get what you what you deserve, but right. you know, we just need to do a better job of working together. Right. No, that 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 completely makes sense. And like you said, when you uh, someone has leverage, that's key when it comes to business negotiation. Whenever you get leverage, um, so I can see that. I'm happy to see Masvidal back in the octagon. On that note, my last thing for you is talk about leverage. Talk about wanting certain things. Conor McGregor, <laughs> does he? Do you see this retirement as an official retirement? Is just another one of his seven retirements? Is he coming back? What are you? What are your expectations for him uh, going forward? It's pretty scary now. Like this is the first time I've actually said maybe he's right. Maybe he's he's real about this. Like if you asked me this a month ago when he when he or when did he retire? Like a month ago or so. Yeah. When he, yeah. when it first happened, I was like, nah. You know, he's just mm -hmm. again. Try to, yeah, he, he's just trying to insert himself in there because nobody's talking about him. Right. So it's, but the fact that he, you know, I, even after the Masvidal fight, like the old Connor would have been on the internet chirping and chirping, oh, yeah. I'm tired, but here I am. But I think at some crazy level, I almost think he may have found peace within himself. Like based on the last fight, how humble he came off and how at peace with himself he was after beating Donald Cerrone. Him hanging out with Tony Robbins, like he may have found something in his life that he may not need the the approval of the fight world in order to maintain right. his identity. He may not need it no more. So he, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't come back. Like he's rich, he doesn't need to come back. But yeah. I think what he needed before was attention, and now it seems like he may not need that attention. That's a really interesting way you put that. And like you said, I think the way he approached the Donald Cerrone fight is what kind of supports what you're saying. Because it was just, we've never seen a Connor like that. He just seemed yeah, at peace. He seemed at peace and just seemed like he wanted to compete and just like do something for himself. And he put on probably one of his better performances of his career and then hugged Donald Cerrone, hugged his grandmother and walked away. Yeah, I was like, what? And yeah. I just... As a selfishly, I want to be like, man, I want to see you fight Gaethje, Khabib winner. I want to see you fight Nate Diaz. Just finish that trilogy. I want to see you go for three belts. Um, but obviously, him as an individual, if you find peace, and like you said, if there's just no reason for you to do something you don't want to do, you have to support that at the end of the day. Yeah, I support that wholeheartedly, man. This is too tough of a sport and too dangerous of a sport to do half-assed. you got to go in with everything. Right. Well, Dean... I appreciate you. Um, as always, my friend, is there anything you need to tell the audience? Where can they find you? Uh, fighters, listeners, you have your show. Please plug away. Oh, my God. Yeah, so please, uh, you can listen to me every day on ESPN West Palm. Just if you have smart speakers from 3 to 5 Eastern time, if you have smart speakers, just say, hey, Google, play ESPN 106.3, and we'll come up. Um, yeah, that's about it. Listen to me on there and then just follow me on Instagram at Dean Thomas, Dean spelled D-I-N Thomas. Awesome. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate you like always.